Hi, this is Kyle Sivkowski for APGov, and in this video, we're going to be looking at the executive branch a little bit more closely and touching upon uh, Federalist Paper number 70, as well as looking at how the president communicates and utilizes modern technology and everything from the State of the Union to communicate the agenda. So again, referencing back to Federalist number 70, and there is a video on this, um, but just to mention a couple of key points here, is that of course this is going to be argued by Alexander Hamilton, and he's going to be advocating for a single and strong executive leader. And again, notice how this really contrasts to the Articles of Confederation. Um, he's going to argue in Federalist number 70 that it should not have a council. You should not have a council of different people together, that instead it's more more advantageous to have just one single person and have that person be strong with some power. And he goes on to argue that having one person would add accountability, as opposed to if you had several people on a council, it's hard to hold one person accountable because one person could blame the other person on the council and the other person could blame another person on the council. Whereas if there's just one person, you can only hold that person accountable and that's a lot easier to do. He also advocates that certainly this is going to ensure more energy in the executive, which is important for the country, and also prevent and defend against legislative encroachments on presidential power. Right, so if the legislative branch is going to pass something that the president thinks is not advantageous for the country, certainly the president could execute the veto power, and certainly that is a very important check against the legislature. And then lastly, it's going to allow purpose, direction, and flexibility in the branch. One thing especially is that the executive branch would be able to respond a lot more quickly to emergencies and wars, unlike Congress. For example, when Congress has to even pass a bill, think about how long it takes, think about all the obstacles involved. Having a president who can respond more quickly doesn't need to you know, consult a total of 535 people to pass something, um, can, can basically act a lot more quickly and respond to emergencies as they happen. So certainly there's going to be a lot more flexibility in the executive branch. And for these reasons, that's why Hamilton is, again, advocating for a single and strong executive leader. Okay, so voters and the president. Certainly, public support is very, very important um, for the president. And again, keep in mind that even though the president is not a member of Congress, the president is certainly going to try to push an agenda as to what he or she is going to want Congress to eventually pass. Public approval, in addition, gives the president leverage. Again, not command. It does not guarantee success. Uh, think of, for example, President Obama. Certainly there was public support uh, for some of his initiatives, but with a Republican control of Congress, that did not guarantee success by any means. Now, there's also this idea known as mandates, that after somebody wins an election, sometimes, again, think of the Electoral College, you know, you win by 100 electoral votes, even though the popular vote you may have only won by 2 or 3%, but it gives the president the perception sometimes that the voters strongly support his or her character and policies. Note that mandates are very infrequent, but presidents will claim them anyway, saying that, oh, yes, the people want you know, this particular policy voted upon and passed in Congress because, again, they voted me, voted for me. I won by a landslide in the election. So therefore, Congress, you better get on board or you might get, you know, voted out of office. Again, mandates typically do not happen that much. Um, and again, it's more of a perception rather than a reality. Okay, going public certainly is a very important strategy for the president as it is considered amongst the greatest source of influence and power of a president. If you have public support, you know, Congress is going to need to get on board to some extent, depending on how strong that is. And one way that the president's going to do that is by having uh, staging events, uh, appearing at rallies, getting the public's attention, utilizing all forms of media from television, radio, uh, and especially social media. As head of state, presidents often perform many ceremonial functions, which again are going to get favorable press coverage. So when the presidents um, are at the the Medal of Honor ceremonies, that's a fantastic opportunity to gain favorable coverage. Ultimately, the more favorable coverage, certainly the better one's image is going to be. And then dealing with presidential approval, that is very important as this is a big effort by anyone in the White House 
Many different factors go into what the presidential rating is going to be. Certainly, people come in with their predispositions of what the president is, uh, depending on your ideology. Certainly, you have the honeymoon um, time period where the first six months on average tend to be the best time to have a president get his or her legislation uh, passed in Congress and get policies passed, holding rallies, certainly. And ultimately, if your approval rating goes up, certainly that's going to highlight a good decision. If it goes down, that might highlight a very negative decision. When you look at some of the presidential ratings, it's very interesting at their first year mark. A net approval with JFK back in 1961, 69%. George W. Bush, not too much far behind, 68%. Now keep in mind that was a product of September 11 to an extent because his approval rating shot up. But you see certainly very, very um, high numbers. Now with Donald Trump, at the end of 2017, he was down actually 15%. So he was actually more unfavorable uh, compared to favorable. Now certainly what's interesting about this setup is that uh, there has been an attack on polls and certainly with 2016, the polls were not accurate in forecasting the correct winner. Um, so again, Typically, if you're in office, you might say, well, I'm not sure I believe in these polls. These polls are not entirely accurate, but when they are you know, very favorable, then you see the, the president or members of Congress embracing such polls, nevertheless. So the public presidency, certainly policy support is very important. You might have televised messages. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but also the president has what's called the bully pulpit, and this was coined by FDR, the fantastic way to advocate your agenda, right? You are just one person in the branch, you're the head of the government, people look to you, so you have a lot of influence in terms of getting your message out. Now, the public may not be receptive to that particular message or maybe misperceive it at all, but um, sometimes it can be very useful, and FDR was very, very good um, in terms of mobilizing the public in terms of getting support. Now, one thing that can work is when the president might say, well, contact your local congressperson, right? Tell them to get working to support this particular policy or agenda. That can be difficult because sometimes there's a lot of apathy. So you're asking people to, you know, get moving to start doing something, but uh, that's not always going to be the case. Um, sometimes um, it could backfire because there could be a lack of response. So certainly that is something that a president doesn't want. So ultimately, when you're the president, you have to be very careful as to when you go public and you have to be pretty sure that there's support behind. So that's where, again, polling is very important. Another important way that the president is going to be communicating with the public is the State of the Union, which is required under Article 2 of the Constitution. It's traditionally given once a year before Congress, and it is, of course, televised to the nation. You'll see it on various uh, news stations as well as the major channels. And this is a great opportunity for the president to take credit, tout success, tout numbers and statistics that are favorable. And you notice it's very much an annoying speech to watch because there's a lot of clapping standing, and the mo there's really not a lot of momentum. Nevertheless, this is a great opportunity for the president to use an agenda-setting agenda effect in terms of setting policy initiatives for the year, things that the president wants to get accomplished. So when you watch the State of the Union, be sure to look for how the president is communicating. Uh, it's very interesting, and it's always interesting, too, to see the facial expressions of the people sitting behind you. Here, of course, you have the vice president, who, of course, is going to be supporting you, and then you have the Speaker of the House, um, in this case, uh, Speaker um, Boehner, uh, who of course was a, the Republican Party, uh, certainly going to have more of a frown on his face compared to Joe Biden. All right, so the president and the press, certainly uh, the presidents and the media are often adversaries, and you see that no more than with Donald Trump um, constantly going back and forth with the media. Now keep in mind, the media does certainly needs stories, but at the same time, the presidents want to convey their message. So they sort of both need each other, which is interesting. Now the president is going to have a press secretary, and that is going to be the main contact person, and they are the ones who are interacting. They are the liaison, basically, between the president and the media. Now, what's interesting is that since the 1960s, starting around the Vietnam War and then certainly into the Watergate um, era, you're going to see that news coverage of presidents is going to become um, extremely more negative um, since this uh, time period. Prior to the 1960s, the media and the presidency, they were pretty much very close. I mean, again, a good example of FDR is that, you know, you would not necessarily have known if you're just a regular member of the public that he was in a wheelchair. They never showed any photos of that out of respect. Today, that would never happen. So very interesting how times have changed. 
And then you also have a shift to social media. I mean, in many ways, Donald Trump is the Twitter in chief. He communicates directly to the people without the news media, quote unquote, filtering the substance. So you see an example here. The fake news media is not in, is not my enemy. It is the enemy of the American people sick. Um, you know, social media is a great platform for all politicians. They can communicate directly with their followers and it's not being filtered by the media. Again, it's no longer completely dependent upon the traditional news media. This, the media has certainly been changing since the advent of the internet and social media. You can respond quickly. Now even, you know, when there's a national emergency of some sort, a person can just tweet about it, you know, you, and it comes right to your phone. You don't necessarily need to go through the traditional media channels. So certainly it, uh, it is a changing landscape in many respects.